Let's turn to 2 Corinthians this morning, chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. As we are going to, God willing, have our hearts encouraged today as we look at God's Word together and these ancient words that He has given us. Christianity, you've probably noticed this, turns the world upside down. What I mean by that right now is not simply like the statement in Acts, the actions of the apostles, they went out and and by God's working through them, the world turned upside down. That's certainly part of it. But what I mean is just the way the Bible teaches us to think turns our world upside down. I think we've seen that in the weeks past in Daniel. When you think of Daniel, most evangelicals think of God as Lord of Heaven. Now, no one argues with that, do they? He is Lord of Heaven. But the Bible says not only is He Lord of Heaven, He is Lord of this earth right now. And that is how most people don't view Him. They view Him as being Lord one day. He'll return. The Bible says He is Lord right now of earth. And those who oppose Him are in rebellion. But He is Lord. The Bible teaches, and we've seen these things in the past, Matthew chapter 5, how do you want to have peace in life? Well, here's what the world tells you to do. Go get you a bottle and drink and forget about your problems. Or the world tells you, why do you read a Bible that makes you feel guilty when you read it? Why do you hear a preacher? It makes you feel guilty when you hear him. Just forget about all this. Turn your back on it. And forget about your problems and you'll feel better. The Bible says, though, the only way to have peace is to have mourning in your heart to begin with. We see our sin, we come to God with clean hands and we confess our sins to Him. And the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Not those who forget their sins, but those who confess their sins. Uh, The world says, how are you going to inherit the earth one day? You'll inherit the earth one day if you have a big enough army. And with that big enough army, you take over land and you build yourself a kingdom. The Bible says this, though. The Bible says, no, if you want to inherit the land, the earth, you're going to be humble and meek and gentle because that's the people that God gives the land to. I I remember hearing this a few, uh, maybe a month or two ago from a, a teaching A preacher was talking about how in ancient Rome, when when the Romans had a child and they no longer wanted that child, maybe he was a child with disabilities, maybe simply they just didn't want the child. I believe he said they would take their child and they would dump him at the garbage heap and leave him there. And the reason they would do that is because that's where the dogs would come at night. Our practice here is no more humane than that in America. The reason I mention that, though, is even back then, what you had were Christians coming and rescuing those children and raising them as their own. And the Romans could not understand, why are these Christians doing that? Our thinking as Christians is radically different than the thinking of this world. How do you live as a Christian? You have to die first. It's like you take one of those seeds It's got to get dried out. It looks like there's nothing left in it, but then you stick it in the ground and something comes forth. How do we grow? We have to die first. We die to our own wishes. We we die to our own desires. We die to our way of life. And we come to God and say, Lord, my life is not mine. It's Your life. And God gives us life. Well, this morning, in 2 Corinthians, we have another truth that turns our thinking upside down. Here's the truth we have today. When we are weak, then we are strong. That's what the Bible says. When you are weak as a Christian, that is when you are strong as a Christian. That is not what the world says. The world says show no pain. The world says forget about all that that's past. Forget about who you you have to trample on to get to where you want. Forget about who you have to push out of the way to, to aspire to the corporate la- the ladder. The Bible says, rather, it's when we are weak. That's when we are strong. And that's what we're going to see today. Look here in verse 7 with me. 
I want us to see something of the setting about what's going on. The Apostle Paul, this is the second inspired letter that he has written to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is a church that has a lot of pride in their midst. Uh, they were very gifted by God. God had blessed them tremendously of spiritual uh, blessings, spiritual gifts. And yet they thought because God had blessed them of spiritual blessings and spiritual gifts, they thought they had arrived. And if you know anything about 1 Corinthians, you know this, that Paul just has to lay out so much there in 1 Corinthians that's wrong with the Corinthian church. There's much that's good though. Let's not overlook that. But Paul just had to basically drop a bomb on the church and say, this is wrong, that is wrong, you're, pr- you're proud here, you got pride here, you've got to be humbled by God. And then we get to 2 Corinthians, and what the church is doing here now is there's false apostles, they're called super apostles, and these super apostles like to boast about themselves. They like to talk about themselves. That's one, that's one thing that I can't, I can't stand about politics. And on, on one level, at least a little bit, we can feel sorry for the politician because they're expected to talk this way. But one reason that, that it's so difficult at times to listen to politicians is because they always tell you why you should vote for them. I mean, it's just over and over. Vote for me because I do this. I believe that. I do this. I'm the best at this. I've done this in the past. I can do this in the future. And after a while, you just want to plug your ears and say, please stop talking about yourself. Well, here in Corinth, the Corinthian church liked that. They wanted to hear about what all these so-called apostles had done. They were starting to follow the false teachers and not the true teacher. So what Paul begins to do And he's doing this not to boast about himself. He's doing this to help them see that he's a true apostle. He begins to talk about all the things that God has blessed him in. He begins, look in verse 1, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. He begins to talk to them about the, the visions that God had given him, taking him up to the third heaven. He didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body. He begins to talk about revelations that he had had. says in verse 4, was caught up into paradise. This was the apostle's experience. The only reason he's mentioning it here, though, is to help them see that he's a true apostle. But when you come down to verse 7, he begins to talk about really what he wants to boast about. He does not want to boast about the things that he has seen. He doesn't want to boast about the things that he had accomplished. He wanted to boast about God ultimately. And how did he boast about God? He boasted about God by boasting about his weakness. About his weakness. And each and every one of us here, you may have come in here this morning thinking that your weaknesses that God allows you to have shows that God really doesn't love you that much. When the fact of the matter is this, the weaknesses that God has given you is a sign of his love for you. And that's what we're going to, partly what we're going to see today. In the Christian life, the way you grow is through weakness. Weakness. Now, I'm not talking about uh, weakness in fighting against sin. We all know we are to fight against sin. We are to give sin no quarter in our life. No housing. We are not, we're not to play games of sin. We know that. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's not talking about being a coward either. It grieves me today to see leaders that, that appear at least on the surface to be cowards in the church. You, you look, you don't know them personally, but you see what they're saying. You see what they're not saying. You say, why aren't they saying what's most important? Why aren't they standing for truth here? Paul's not talking about being weak and being cowardly. That's the opposite of what a Christian is. In Revelation, you may remember that, that list in Revelation that, that talks about those who will go to the lake of fire. Liars are on that list and so forth. I believe the first on that list is cowards. So he's not speaking about being a coward. We are to be valiant for truth. We are to stand for truth when the world is burning and everyone around us is pointing, saying that person's crazy because he believes a man's a man and a woman's a woman. When when we stand on the gospel truths that God has given us, we have to say, hey, you may think I'm weird, you may think I'm strange, I will not budge though because I know this is true. I know this is true. So when Paul says about weakness here, he's not speaking about being a coward. We are to be strong in that sense. Let's, let's start reading 
I want you to see something of the context here. Start reading with me in verse 7. <clears throat> because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, because of how great the things that Paul saw, things that no man should speak on earth, and some things he could not speak and did not speak, because of the great things that God in mercy had lifted this persecutor of the church who persecuted the infant church, God lifted this man up and saved him. He had mercy on him. He showed him all these things because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, now, we may have not seen the things that Paul had seen, but all of us have this temptation of thinking we're more than we really are. Doesn't matter how strong we are, doesn't matter how much we try to kill it. Sin is the, pride in one sense is the root of all sin. And we have to fight against it and struggle against it and seek to put it to death. The apostle Paul, the man who had been to heaven and back, is no exception to this. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. To keep me from pride, he said. There was given me a thorn in the flesh. Now, what's Paul speaking about there? Now, we don't know that. We're going to look at maybe some possibilities. That's really not what we're looking at today. Because it could be anything. The main thing, the main thing that we draw from this teaching is what is our thorn in the flesh that God has given us? There was given me a thorn in the flesh. Look how it's described. A messenger of Satan. Now notice it says there was given me. This is from God. God gave Paul this. Not because he hated Paul, because he loved Paul. I've got some chickens behind my house. And uh, though I have mixed reasons for doing this, one of the reasons I have for trimming their feathers is because I love them. Or I love my family. We don't want them to die. But I don't want them to die. i got them fenced in. If they fly out without the rooster by themselves, they're more likely to get killed. So what do I do? I cut most of their wings so they can't fly properly. We may say... In effect, this, why are, you, why are you keeping me grounded, Lord? Why are you keeping me grounded for? And it may be because God says, because I love you too much, and I know what would happen if you start to fly high. I know what's going to happen. God loves Paul, and He knows what will happen if He lets Paul just go. And, and, just, and just no discipline, no, no struggles. Oh, he's, even the great apostle, what will he do? He'll be filled with pride just like the devil. Just like the devil. That's what happened to the devil. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. This is not child's play here. This is serious. And some of you right now, I've mentioned a thorn in the flesh. I've mentioned a messenger of Satan. And maybe instantly something comes to your mind in your own life. Again, we're not talking about sin. We're not talking about being a coward. We're talking about weakness. We're talking about struggles. Something comes to your mind instantly. And it's, it's not easy. It's hard. It's difficult. And here for the Apostle Paul, this wasn't something light. This was something that tormented him. It was difficult on the Apostle Paul. So God gave him this, but look, at, again, it says a messenger of Satan. This was Satan doing that to Paul. And what we see, like it's been said, is that the devil is God's devil. God uses the devil for his own purposes. The devil thinks he's going to kill you. The devil thinks he's going to kill Paul. But God says, no, I'm just using you for my purposes here. Just like Assyria and Isaiah. Assyria is an axe in God's hand. Assyria has punished God's people. Not because Assyria was great, but because God called them to do that out of judgment. In the same way, God sometimes uses the devil to come into our life, even true believers, to torment us, to attack us, to do different things to us. And it's in the plan of God to protect us, to build us up, to strengthen us. Do you remember what happened to Jesus? After Jesus is baptized, the Bible says the Spirit brought Him into the wilderness. 
To what? To be tempted by the devil. That was God leading Jesus to be tested, I should say, tested by the devil. So, God gives the thorn in the flesh. The devil is working, but God is working through the devil. Then it says, to keep me from exalting myself. This was to help Paul. And maybe you hear you have a struggle in your life. Uh, it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be a number of things. And it may be, it may be. Now, there's, there's different reasons for this. But one of the reasons may be that God has allowed this to come upon you. Because God wants through this to help you in some way. And this may be encouraging to you. Look in verse 8. Concerning this, I implored. Paul's not just saying, you know, saying something and going about his, about his day and just forgetting about it. It says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And God did not answer his prayer the way Paul wanted it. He did answer it but not the way Paul wanted it answered. Now here's, here, here's a teaching out there, and it's tormented people before. If you only had enough faith, Christian, you'd have all the money you wanted, and you'd never get sick. Why, why are you sick today? I'll tell you why. You don't, have, you don't have enough faith. Why do you have cancer? Why does your loved one have cancer? Because they didn't have enough faith. If they had enough faith, God would have healed them. That's what the Bible says. That's a teaching from hell. And it's hurt a lot of good-hearted Christians by thinking that the reason they're sick is because they didn't have enough faith. Well, let me ask you, did the Apostle Paul have enough faith? <laughs> yes. And he prayed three times, and his prayer was not answered the way that God, or um, the way that Paul wanted it answered. And still, God loved him. Paul was a man of faith. God has not promised to answer our prayer the way we want it all the time. He's not promised to do that. And that, and what we see here is the teaching that says if you had enough faith, you'd be healed. If you had enough faith, your disease would be gone. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't be poor. If you had enough faith, strange, isn't it? Jesus was poor and died on a cross as a criminal in the eyes of the Romans. I wonder if he had enough faith. So take that idea and throw it away from you and never think about it again because it's false. Here is the Apostle Paul praying earnestly that God would deliver him three times. And here's what God says. This is what He says to us, verse 9. And He has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. That's what He says. My grace is enough for you. My grace is enough for you, Paul. And look what it says next. For power is perfected. In weakness. In weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. We'll look at that more in a moment. We'll stop there for now. So what we see here in this context, the Apostle Paul, he has seen so many great things. And God loves this man so much to make sure that he is not lifted up in pride and falls into sin. To make sure of that, God sends him something in his life. It may have been his eye problem that we're going to see in a minute. It may have been that. It may have been something else. It may have been multiple things. But God sent something His way to keep him humble. To make sure that first of all, he did not get lifted up with pride, and secondly, that he kept trusting in the Lord. This is the apostle. How much more do we need that? Right? This is the apostle Paul. I think it's right to say the greatest Christian to ever live. And he needed this. How much more do we need it then in our lives? Let's look at some different weaknesses. This, this weakness here, can, it can speak to different things in our life. Let's start here. Let's, let's talk about physical conditions. Physical conditions. Maybe sicknesses, illnesses, but physical conditions. Let me read some from Galatians. It's the next book, actually, right beside 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4, starting in verse 13. <clears throat> 
This is Paul speaking. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus Himself. Now listen to verse 15. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Most likely what that means is Paul had some serious eye problems when he was preaching to the Galatians. And if you look in chapter 6, verse 11, Paul says, See what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Now, now normally in a New Testament letter, uh, the apostle or whoever it was would maybe speak out loud and someone would write the letter for them. And this is probably what's happening, but here Paul maybe picks the pen up and writes it himself. And one reason perhaps he has to write in such large letters is because his eyesight's so bad. So maybe this thorn in the flesh was his eyesight. So bad he couldn't hardly see. You think about modern technology. There was no modern technology, at least like we have today back then. This is a serious thing for Paul. And still he went on in weakness. Still God used him in a mighty, mighty way. And you may be here today and you have a, for no reason of your own, for no, for no fault of your own, there's something physical, some condition that you have, something that's come upon you. And, and, and sometimes you think, why has the Lord allowed me to do, to go through this for? And though the answers will not always be there for us, we won't, we won't ever know exactly all the reasons why. And yet it may be that God has allowed this to come to you so you can be weak, and yet strong in the Lord. Let me ask you this. When sickness comes over you, are you more likely to pray then than when you're not sick? When some physical ailment comes upon you, maybe you, you, you've caught something, you're sick, or whatever the case is, you've hurt yourself, whatever. When some sickness comes to you and you're down in the bed, not feeling well, are you more apt to pray and trust in the Lord then? Than at other times? At those times, we are reminded what life is all about. Life is not about fun and games, though that's fun to have games. I enjoy that. That's not what life is about, though. When you're sick, you're reminded, my life is not just here. If it was, if this is all that I had is what I see, I'd be miserable. Because my life's going to end one day. In fact, I feel like it's going to end soon, because I'm so sick, you may say. So God gives us these things to remind us of who we are. To see who God is. God doesn't give us these things to bring us lower than we ought to be. He just gives us these things to bring us down to see reality. He just wants us to see what's real. And the fact of the matter, just like we read earlier today, the fact of the matter is this. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. He did not say, apart from me, you can do some things. Or apart from me, you can do small things. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And when God brings us something bodily, illness on, onto us, something hurts in our body, something so small maybe, we're reminded, boy, we're flesh. And this flesh is going to die one day. And I better make sure I'm right with God. And I better make sure I'm praying. And I better make sure I'm feeding on the Word of God and fellowshipping. I better make sure I'm repenting. I better make sure I'm focusing on what's right and true and trusting in Him. I remember when a dear friend got sick years ago. He was a great, strong man. I remember seeing him. He could hardly stand up at times because of what happened to him. That's all, that's all any of us are. That's all any of us are. Some of you may be very, very strong. But you, I hope, know that strength comes from the Lord, doesn't it? What would happen if He took your strength away like that? What would happen? Unfortunately, haven't we seen it in loved ones? What happens when something happens? Some, some illness comes to our life? Haven't we seen what happens when, when a terrible disease comes? Haven't we seen what happens when someone gets injured? That quick! It's like the person has changed. There's nothing like they used to be. Why? The strength is gone. And that strength did not come from ourselves. It came from the Lord. So the Lord gets, the Lord gets our attention through physical conditions. What about this? What about natural abilities? Or the lack thereof sometimes? 
natural abilities. Look what it says in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 10. This is Paul quoting some people. Uh, now, whether this is right or not, we don't know for sure, but it seems like at least some of it is true of Paul. Verse 10, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Look in chapter 11, verse 6. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. That first part, Paul's talking about, even if I'm not skilled in speech, it appears that the Apostle Paul may not have been the greatest preacher as far as what I mean by that is publicly speaking gifts. It appears that maybe he wasn't the best speaker. Do you remember what Moses said in chapter 4 of Exodus? This, I hope, is very encouraging to us. Some of you may say, you know what, I'd love to witness more, but I just... It's just hard for me to speak to people. I don't speak like other people. It's, it's more difficult for me. Well, you know what that should do? That should help you depend on God more to give you the words. Moses. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, Moses said. I can't speak like other people can. And here's what the Lord says. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf? Or seen or blind? Is it not I the Lord? Now then go and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Now Moses may have been putting on a little bit there because he didn't want to go, but still it appears he was slow of speech. And God says, look, I made your mouth. I'll teach you what to say. You have no excuse anymore. Speak for me, Moses. Speak for me. Speak for me. This may help you. You may see yourself and you say, I'm weak in this. I just can't get the words out. That may be God calling you to pray more. To trust in Him more. To go out in faith more. God, through your weakness, is going to make you strong. I would much rather hear a preacher who couldn't speak very well but trusted in God than hear a preacher who trusted in himself and forgot about God and could speak the best of anybody. Let me tell you, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm trying to be too sensitive about things, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Have you ever heard somebody preach before? And you said to yourself, you know what, that was a nice speech, but it really wasn't preaching. You said to yourself, you know what, he said everything right. His diction was good. He was very polished. He didn't misspeak any. He was very organized. But it was more like a speech than a sermon. It was more like someone reading a paper than delivering a message. It doesn't matter how well someone speaks or doesn't speak. It matters how much the Lord is going to use that person. That is what we must have in our heart. It may be circumstances that's our weakness. Look in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. Verse 8 and 9, listen to what the, the Apostle says, "...for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia." That we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. You ever been, you ever had something happen to you or someone else and it just feels like you're stretched and you can't be stretched anymore. In fact, you've been stretched too much and you've already been torn apart. It's just too much. The burden's too heavy. You ever, you ever have a tarp or a tent set up and you're, you put a, you put something on it and, and after a while the burden's just too much and it snaps. It breaks. It's just too much. You got something on a limb, and maybe you're, uh, you're, uh, you've got a deer hanging from a limb, or you got a swing from a limb, and after a while, the burden's just too much, the limb breaks. Well, Paul says here that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. You ever thought you're going to die? Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that 
we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Why does God put us through hardships? It's so that we can trust in God and not ourselves. That's why. What about persecutions? I've been telling you now for some time, unless something happens, I don't see basically any way we're going to escape persecution in this country. It's going to come to us. It's already here in some forms. It's already here. Make no mistake about it. Uh, we're, we're not going to escape unless something changes. Well, chapter 4, listen to what Paul says in verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. He says, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Look back in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's he talking about? He's talking about his own body. He says, we're not some fancy pot. We're a pot made of dirt. And you may say, now why, why did God make the apostles a pot of dirt, so to speak? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. If the Apostle Paul had, if he was a gold pot, so to speak, people would be tempted to think from that gold pot came his power. But if the Apostle Paul describes himself just simply as a pot of clay, when all this good comes from him, everyone knows it's not from a pot of clay. But it must be from God that all this good is coming from. What about temptations? Matthew chapter 26. We read about temptations. Verse 33, But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. That's what Peter says to Jesus. Verse 35, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing. Peter says, Lord, you're talking about falling away. You're talking about this happening. Lord, know this. You can know this, Lord. This apostle's not going to do that. I'm Peter. I'm tough. I'm rough. I'm a fisherman. I'm used to this stuff. Lord, others may fall away. I'm not going anywhere. And we know the story, don't we? Maybe it's through temptation that the Lord humbles us. The Lord doesn't want us to sin, of course, but, but God brings a temptation to our life. And what do we do? We don't pray like Peter was supposed to, but he slept through it. We don't pray like we ought to. And what happens? We give in to that temptation. And through that temptation, and even through that sin that we commit, God humbles us and reminds us that we are nothing without Him. We are nothing without Him. So what we see here very plainly from chapter 12 is that God will give us stuff in our life on purpose because He loves us and He wants to humble us. He wants us to stay away from pride. He wants us to trust in Him. Maybe God doesn't pour out a blessing. Why? Because maybe the person witnessing is going about the wrong way and God loves him too much to do something like that. Let me give you, uh, let me give you two examples of what I'm talking about. Many of you have heard this name. You've heard me talk about him before. Charles Spurgeon died in 1892. You can just tell story after story after story of the most famous preacher of the 19th century. Probably the preacher most well used in the entire 19th century was probably Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, when he was roughly 20 years old, was maybe the most famous preacher in the world. Uh, they couldn't build buildings big enough for the people who wanted to come hear him. He had to tell his people on Sunday night, he told his regular people on Sunday night, you all stay home tonight, let the visitors have a seat. Too many people wanted to hear him. Five to six thousand people, four to six thousand people, every service wanted to hear him. Every service. 
He preached. He traveled. These stories, I think it's 25 years after his death, they were still printing new sermons of his. How is that? He was dead. Well, on Sunday, he normally preached two sermons. And they printed, I suppose, the Sunday morning sermon in the paper. And they and they sold it and things. But the Sunday night sermon was not printed then. So 25 years after his death, they began printing the other sermons that weren't sold or printed in the time of his life. I think there's 53 volumes of his sermons that you can buy. Just massive collection. Uh, someone said that he had the same vocabulary as Shakespeare. He had something of a photographic memory. He, it, was, it was amazing how God used this man. You know what else is amazing? He suffered from great unhappiness at times. Call it depression. He had gout. He said, what's the difference between arthritis and gout? He said something like this. He said, you take the... You take the clamp and you turn it so far, that's arthritis, and when you want to get gout, you turn it just another little bit, and that's gout, he said. He went through these terrible ordeals. Uh, he went to hear, he went to hear another preacher preach, and this preacher preached Charles Spurgeon's sermon to Charles Spurgeon. He just preached a sermon to him. And the, and Charles Spurgeon came up to the preacher afterwards and said, and the preacher was apologetic, I'm so sorry, Mr. Spurgeon, I preached your sermon. And Spurgeon said, no, 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 thank you. I know I'm a Christian now. He had struggles. He had temptations. He, he had depressions. He had these physical ailments. He, he had insults in the paper. He was popular. I mean, he, he was, he was the preacher. And they would, the, the papers at the time would make fun of him and other Christians would make fun of him. Later in life, he had something called the downgrade controversy. It's where people, even people he trained in his college. He never went to college, by the way, but he started his own. But people who went to college with him and trained, even people like that, turned their back upon the truthfulness of the Bible and gave in to things like Darwinism and gave in to, to that kind of teaching and didn't believe the whole Bible was true. He had to go through that. He had to take his church and remove it from the Baptist Union. And they censored him. Why? Because he stood for truth. What am I saying? This man that saw so many blessings, he went through so much heartache. And no doubt that was to keep him humble. Because when you have to tell your regular people to stay home so other people can hear me preach, the temptation to be proud probably is pretty great. Another example is from Judges 7. I love this story in Judges 7. It illustrates what we're looking at and helps us so well in this. <clears throat> Judges, Judges chapter 7. This is about Gideon. Gideon had 32,000 troops with them. Let's read in verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into your hands. Now, did you hear what he said there? The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. The Lord says, Gideon, your army's too big. Isn't that... You say, now wait a minute, what is that about? Well, look at the rest of this verse. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. The Lord says, Gideon, your army's too big. If you go up there and win this, this war, all the people of Israel will think their big army gave them the victory. And they won't think it's me that really gave them the victory. So Gideon's army goes from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. And the Lord gives him the victory through 300. That's a lesson for us. It's a lesson in what we're looking at this morning, but it's a lesson for us when it comes to ministry. God's ordained means of ministry or in His Word. Amen? And as plain as it may seem at times, God's ways here in this book, 
It's the only means that God has promised to give victory to. Gideon could have taken his 32,000 people. He won the war. He won the battle of 300. But Gideon could have taken his 32,000 to war and he would have been defeated. But God gets pleasure in not using gold vessels, remember? God uses earthenware vessels. That's what we are. In the world's eye, that's what the church of Jesus Christ is. We're not a, we're, we're not a, a government agency or whatever. We're not, we're not trying to be what the world wants us to be. The church of Jesus Christ is what God wants her to be. And if we are what God wants us to be, you can bet this, God's blessing will be on our ministry. God's blessing will be on our families. God's blessing. You say, you're crazy preacher. You can have 32,000. But God says only 300. Only 300. Isn't this helpful to us today? You go through life and something happens to you. You go through life and a heartache happens. You go through life, a sickness comes upon you. You go through life, a tragedy happens. You go through life, a temptation comes to you. You can know that as long as we're in the will of God, you can know this, the reason God has sent these things, and even out of the will of God, God still does the same. The reason God has sent this to us is because God wants to teach us something. It's like one man said, God doesn't take us through the water to drown us, but to cleanse us. He doesn't take us through the fire to burn us, but to purify us. God is working in our lives. God is taking us and He's molding us. He's fashioning us into what He wants us to be. He's taking me. He's working in my life. And friends, what we all need to do by the grace of God, is do just what the Apostle says. In that last verse, verse 10, that we didn't read yet. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I see how weak I really am and I start to pray earnestly, and when, I'm, when I see how weak I really am and I say, oh God, forgive me for the sin I'm doing. God, I need You, Lord. I trust in You. When I see how weak I really am and I start pouring my heart out to God, that's when I'm strong. That's when I'm strong. So let us live in such a way that we humble ourselves before God. Let us not live in such a way where God has to humble us. Let us live in such a way that we humble ourselves before Him. And we pray and we trust Him above all things. May the Lord bless you today.